The colors of this gorgeous bird, this butterfly, and this sparkling opal, they don't come from pigments. These colors come from the amazing nanoscopic topography of their structures, not the compounds they contain. It's called structural color. We've been borrowing, copying, and mixing pigments for tens of thousands of years. Just look around you. Almost everything we make has some kind of dye or paint in it. If we could make our own structural color, it would be next level. White light from the sun contains every color, and color is determined by wavelength. The colors in these paints come from pigments, molecules that absorb some wavelengths of light and reflect others based on their molecular structures. So if something looks red, that means it absorbs all the wavelengths of light that we can see except red. Mostly, pigments have double bonds or complex ring structures that absorb light energy. But over time, as more and more light bombards pigment molecules, the energy breaks down their chemical bonds. This decreases the amount of light that the pigment surface can absorb, causing it to reflect a wider range of wavelengths and appear closer to white. In other words, the pigment fades. But pigments aren't the whole color story. Some of the brightest, most stunning colors in nature work differently. They come from nanostructures, like the ones on these wing scales. When light waves hit the morpho butterfly's scales, these tiny ridges bounce the light in a way that adds together the amplitudes of only a certain color. The amplitude, or height, of a light wave is what determines how bright it is. When the crests align like this, that color pops, a phenomenon called constructive interference. Structural colors work because of how tiny the formations are, often only a few hundred nanometers across. How much do you have to zoom in to see these structures? So this is way smaller than, let's say, the thickness of your hair. Imagine having to see like a fraction of that under the microscope. If you know what to look for, structural color is all over the place in nature. Many organisms have it, and they all evolved their own unique style. For example, this male hummingbird has multiple layers of structural color that cause its feathers to shimmer. So a group of researchers decided to try leapfrogging evolution. They wanted to see if they could put any color on anything they wanted. And they started with this one. This mountain bluebird is serving looks. I mean, look at those feathers. That blue, it's gorgeous. I wanna wear it. I want it as a nail polish. I want my car to be blue bird blue. This bluebird gets its stylish hue from an incredibly complicated porous keratin structure with lots of holes like a sponge. The researchers chose to try to mimic the bluebird because its color is angle independent, meaning it stays the same no matter what angle you look at it from. Unlike that hummingbird's neck, whose angle dependent color seems to change based on where you are. The holes and pores in the bird's feathers are disordered and irregularly spaced. The constructive interference works in every direction. Instead of copying the complex nanostructure of the bird's feathers, they used a method called colloidal self-assembly. They started with a saltwater solution and mixed in tiny plastic particles, little reflective beads. They applied this mix to a glass slide and let it dry into a film. When they altered the distance between the beads, the size of the beads, and the pattern that they make, they could change both the color and whether it was angle dependent or independent. Okay, great. But the problem with using colloidal self-assembly for this is that it's too unpredictable. To replicate something like the Bluebird's brilliant blue, they would have to spend countless hours in the lab slowly changing each of these parameters, testing thousands of configurations until they match the color just right. Not exactly time efficient. Those structures have to be arrayed, meaning they have to be all lined up in a certain way, and they all have to be a certain size. Instead, they made a computer model to do all that for them. The type of model they used is called a Monte Carlo model, and not for no reason. A Monte Carlo model relies on repeated random sampling, kind of like poker, but super fast. The model allowed the researchers to run hundreds of simulations, showing them all the possible colors they could make with different sized beads and different spacing between them. One of those possible colors matched the bluebird's bright blue, at least theoretically. When they used the model's recipe to actually make it in the lab, the result was a colored film within what's called the JND, the Just Noticeable Difference. 
that is a technical term. In other words, it was super close to the color that they wanted. Could you get specific enough to say like, I don't just want blue, but I want like 451 nanometer blue. That is the holy grail of being able to design your structural color. But for now, our job is really to create something within that range. People who study color estimate that we can see 10 million possible colors, but only a fraction of those can be made from known pigments. If we could crack the structural color code, we wouldn't have the limitation of finding and putting together the right ingredients to isolate new colors. We could go right to the source, the wavelengths of light. And that could make the world around us both more beautiful and more efficient. Yes, I said efficient. It's about more than just pretty things. We could make computer screens that use structural color rather than emitting light, making laptops or phones with no glare and super long battery lives. And structural color coatings on windows could reflect infrared light while letting visible light in, reducing the carbon footprint of one of the most energy intensive things we do, cool our buildings. Just imagine painting your world with nature's full color palette with morpho blue and peacock green and opal pink and every wavelength in between. Colors that took evolution millennia to create. What was your path to the job that you're in now? I love to solve problems, especially technical ones. And so I was really intrigued by the problem. So it was just a matter of being very curious and, and wanting to help out. I like love that spirit of curiosity driving science. 